Today we're going to take a look at a third way of evaluating limits. So I know that I didn't actually have a chance to be with you last Thursday to talk about um, limits. Um, hopefully you watched the video and took good notes um, because you had a quiz on it today, right? Um, so there's two ways so far that you have learned to evaluate limits. One of them is from a graph, and then one of them is numerically, which means from a table, right? So we're going to discuss the third way of evaluating limits today, which is called analytically. Um, analytically is another word for algebraically. Okay, so I will use them interchangeably um, because different resources use them interchangeably. So just be aware those two words mean the same thing, analytically or algebraically. Um, so some basic properties of limits first. Um, so if we have um, B and C as just real numbers, any real numbers you'd like, and N is a positive integer, then the limit of a constant, b, is just b. And if you think about this from a graphical standpoint, the line y equal b is just a horizontal line at the level b, right? That's what it would be, what it would be equal to. Anyway, um, and so, yeah, the limit is going to be the same y value everywhere along that horizontal line. So it makes sense that the limit of a constant is simply that constant value. Um, number two, it says the limit of x as x approaches c is c. So if you think about what this equation is, this right here is in essence the equation y equals x. So it's you know, a very basic, familiar to you line, looks something like this. And at every point along that line, the x, e x value and the y value match, right? So there's no holes, there's no jumps, it's a beautiful, simple graph, and sure enough, every x value and every y value match, so it makes sense that if I'm trying to evaluate as x gets close to c, then the limit for the y value is going to be that y is getting close to c. An extension of that on part three, or number three here, is that the limit as x approaches c of x to the n is c to the n. Now, you might look at number two and number three and feel like, well, aren't we just replacing the variable with the constant? And I know the constant here is the letter C, but it, it's a constant for what we're working with. Um, and the answer is yes. When we're able to do it, that's what it means to evaluate analytically or algebraically. We're replacing the variable for the X value that we're approaching. Now, we're going to find out as we continue farther along that it doesn't always work to simply just take the x out and plug the number in and, and we get an answer. But when it does work, it's very friendly. It's very nice. So keep in mind that when it feels like, are we just evaluating, like just plugging it in like in pre-calculus? For a lot of them, it's going to feel just like that, and that's why. All right, so we do have a few properties of limits to be aware of. And limits are really wonderful. They, they do everything that we sort of would hope and dream that they would do. Everything that we want to be true works. You're going to find out as we continue along in calculus that's not true for every kind of operation we do. But for limits, it is. So let's take a look at some of these um, properties of limits. Um, so a few kind of conditions at the beginning is just to remember B and C are real numbers. N's a positive integer, F and G are functions, and they're functions that have limits. Um, the limit of F of X as X approaches C is L, and then the limit of G of X as X approaches C is K. Okay, so these are the values they're approaching. So the first one's called a scalar multiple, and a scalar multiple says that when we multiply something times the limit, it's just, or times a function, and we take the limit, it's just that value, B here, multiplied by the limit. So in essence, what that's actually sort of showing you is that you can take this b and you can kind of move it to the outside of the limit. That's what it's really saying. I've just got the b value and it's multiplied by the limit itself, which was k, or, or the, sorry, which is l. So it doesn't really have a lot of effect or it affects it in a very natural way. It may be a better way of saying that. Number two, sums and differences. Sums and differences are wonderful. They're saying if we add two functions together, it's the same thing as adding their individual limit and then take the limit. It's the same as adding their individual limits together. Again, it's kind of like saying I can take this limit of f of x plus g of x and I can break it up. I can write that this is the limit as x approaches c of f of x plus or minus the limit 
as x approaches c of g of x. It's what we would expect and hope to be true. I can break apart addition and subtraction and do the individual limits and then combine those answers together. Not only that, but works the same for products too. I can break apart products in the very same way that I broke apart the sums or the differences. I can find the limit as x approaches c of f of x, and I can multiply it by the limit as x approaches c of g of x. So in my um, classes that I teach for elementary school teachers, um, like the math courses that they do, the content and the reasoning behind it, um, one of the things that we worked on yesterday was this sort of idea that when we're solving equations, and you guys have solved equations forever at this point, it probably feels like, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Um, we don't even think about it when we're doing it because you're very accustomed to doing it. It's very natural. You just know how to solve equations. You know how to move things between the sides of the equations, add things, subtract things, multiply, divide. You know how to do all of that, so you don't even think about what's going on behind the scenes. Limits feels very much the same way. All of these properties are so natural that when you use them, you don't even realize that you're using them. So as we start doing some of the examples, um, it's a couple slides still away, I'm going to show you where you're using them, not because I need you to be aware of it all the time, but because I want you to realize that there's a lot going on behind the scenes that you sort of take for granted, right? So there's a couple more here. Um, the quotient, again, just like with products, with sums and differences, I can break them apart. So I can break this apart. I'll write it over here because I'm kind of out of space. And as long as the denominator is not zero, right, I can let the limit of f of x be found first, and it's the numerator, and I divide that by the limit of g of x. So I can break the limit apart into the individual pieces, find those, and then divide them. Again, as long as the denominator is not zero, the k value is not zero. And then powers have the same thing. Now, Powers is really just an extension of this idea of the product, right? If I multiplied f of x times f of x times f of x times f of x n times, that's f of x to the n, right? So this is just an extension of that. So this is, in essence, saying that I've got the limit as x approaches c of f of x, and I do it multiple times multiplied by each other, and so that's the same as doing it n times, and I can raise the, or the uh, limit value L to the power of N, okay? So there's nothing earth shattering here. It's all very expected um, and not always how things work out um, with other operations, but it's great for limits. So let's take a look and I'll show you a couple of them and try to pinpoint for you what properties we might be using. So this is an example, number one. And again, if we're able to, our goal is to simply replace the value x with the value it's approaching, in this case, 1. That's what we're going to do. So what we're going to do in terms of what it looks like written down is we're going to attempt to write down something like this, right? Negative quantity 1 squared plus 1. It looks like evaluation. And if I simplify that, what do I get? 0, right? OK. OK. But so what I want you to see is that there are several of those properties I just talked about that are going on behind the scenes. First, there's the addition property. I broke it apart, right? I evaluated the first piece. I evaluated the second piece. That's going on there. There's actually a coefficient of a negative, right? That was that scalar multiple going on there. There's that C to the N one, that earlier one that I had on the first slide, um, the very, very first slide. That's going on there where I have the... That's not what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to do. Where I have that power of 2, and I'm saying I can actually plug it into the x value as well. Okay? So there's at least three different properties going on that we sort of just gloss right over when we evaluate it at 1, right? They're there. We just don't really think about them as we use them. Number 2, same sort of thing. Again, we're just trying to plug the value in, evaluate it, substitute it, and if it works, that's great, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes. So what it's saying that my x value is approaching is negative 3. So in each location where I have an x, I'm going to replace it with negative 3. So it looks something like that. 
I clean everything up, what do I get for my limit value? Negative 9 over 2. Perfect. But again, what properties do I have going on here? Just to make you sort of appreciate how beautiful it is that you don't have to think about them. Well, there's a quotient, right? There's a difference. There's a sum. There's a coefficient or a scalar multiple. There's a lot of properties going on behind the scenes that allow us to be able to do what we just did, which was to simply you know, substitute in the value or plug in the number. So three methods you've had so far. The first one was graphical. The second one was numerical. And now we're seeing algebraic. And when we're able to simply plug the number in, algebraic, it's the easiest. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, way less work. I mean, I, who really liked to doing that table that I asked you to do on the quiz? Probably none of you, right? Probably not. It's a lot of steps. It's kind of tedious. This isn't, it's very clean. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't always work that we can simply evaluate. There are problems that happen sometimes. So let's take a look at a few different um, properties still, some theorems, before we get to some, seeing some of the problems that can occur. So theorem 1.3 talks about specific kinds of functions, in particular polynomial functions and rational functions. So you would have encountered these in college algebra or maybe a high school algebra course, depending on what, where you took your algebra. So this is actually telling us on number one and number two that everything that I just told you on the previous two slides with all these properties in place with the addition and the subtraction and the multiplication and division that allow you to just evaluate it as long as the denominator is not zero, that they work. So the first one says, sure enough, if you have a polynomial, you can just evaluate it. That's why you're seeing this P of X become P of C. And again, as long as the denominator is not zero, for a rational function, rational just means it's got a ratio, right? It's a polynomial on top of a polynomial, so you see this polynomial division going on. That you can do the same thing. You can, as long as the denominator is not zero, simply evaluate, well, let me do it here first, evaluate the rational function, which means evaluating the numerator's polynomial and evaluating the denominator's polynomial, and then dividing them. Again, works exactly like we would hope that it would work. It works for radical functions, too. So the limits involving radicals. Um, so our indexes are not always square roots. They could be, but we could have cube roots or fourth roots, things like that. So anytime we're dealing with the nth root, we can evaluate it. And it tells you there's this one sort of ca caveat down here. It says for all c where c is, where, I'm sorry, where n is odd, and it's valid for c is greater than zero when n is even. So let me just tell you why it has that condition, and you'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that from somewhere along the way. So the fact about n being even and the fact about n being odd. So for n is equal to odd, I'm just going to let n equal to 3, and for n equal to even, I'm just going to say n equal to 2 so that we have a reference point. So when we're dealing with a cube root of x or we're dealing with a square root of x, you don't necessarily have to write the square, there are different values that we can plug in to each of these that are allowed, like domain stuff, right? Cube roots have any input. You, you don't have any problem. So that's why it's telling you that it works for all C when you have odd roots. You can have positive, you can have negative, you can have zero, it's all good. But when you deal with square roots or fourth roots, in particular even roots, you don't have radicals that have negatives underneath them in that case. Now. That may be a little bit of a strong statement. At least you don't for what we're working with in calculus, because we're working on the calculus of real numbers. And anytime you deal with, like, the square root of a negative number, that's the imaginary number system, which is totally fine. It's just not what we're doing our calculus in at the moment, okay? So that's why it has that condition at the end that we're making sure we're talking about valid domain values. That's all. All right, and then a composite function. Um, so composite functions are the ones that you encounter, again, in college algebra where you're like, ooh, those are kind of messy. So they're sort of functions inside of functions. They're embedded functions. So you might end up with um, like an example of a composite function. Might be the square root, well, let's see y equals first, but the square root of um, x squared plus 2, 
So x squared plus 2 is already a function, and it's inside of another one, namely the square root part. Right, so functions inside of functions are composite functions. And again, it's telling you the same thing. You can simply evaluate the inside function, find its limit, and then use that value to plug into the outer function and go from there. So again, it continues to work as you would hope that it would. All right, so you ready to see a problem? Like a problem that has a problem, yeah? Because I keep telling you it's gonna happen, right? Now's the time, problem with a problem. All right, so I told you earlier, our goal, what we would like to see happen in all the cases, which would be super friendly, is if we could just plug the values in. That's, that's what algebraic, you know, sort of boils down to in the very end of a problem. So the problem, of course, happens here, that when I try to do that, what do I get? I get zero as a denominator, but I also get zero as a numerator. Okay. So if I just got zero as a denominator and the numerator was, you know, five, that wouldn't matter. It, it, I mean, it would matter. It wouldn't be this case. This is a very specific zero over zero issue that I'm addressing, okay? So the fact that I have the zero over the zero actually means that what I originally had could have been factored and simplified. That's what it means, <coughs> okay? So if you ended up with five over zero, just say for a moment that this said five over zero, you would say, does not exist, you'd be done. If you end up with zero over zero, you really don't know if it exists yet. It's still undetermined. You haven't finished things enough to know for sure. So what does it mean? Well, it means I need to go back to the original function of the limit, the limit, in, the function inside the limit and take a look at what I have. So in particular, the numerator, it, it can't be factored um, in any you know, usable way because it's already a linear value, right? Three minus x is linear. But the denominator is quadratic. So we're going to take the limit as x approaches 3, and we need to write that every single time until we actually plug the value in and get an answer, okay? Which we haven't yet because we got 0 over 0. That's not my answer. And I need to try and factor. So I already said the numerator, yeah, I've still got 3 minus x. What in the world does the denominator factor into? Yeah, do you remember the special form that's called? Anybody? It's a difference of squares. Indeed, it's a difference of squares. So our goal is to see how in the world that the numerator and the denominator cancel a similar or same factor. These don't have exactly the same factor, but they have similar ones. Which two are the most similar? It's not exactly a trick question, but it's not as obvious as it may seem either. Yeah, it is. So the 3 minus x and the x minus 3 are the most similar because the signs are different, right? One's positive sign, the other one's negative sign. Whereas this one over here, both signs are the same. Okay, so the two that I circled are the most similar. But they're not exactly the same, agreed? How different are they? Say that, out, say that louder. Yeah, like if I multiplied one of them by negative one, they'd be the same. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's exactly right. They're exactly opposite. So for instance, if I plugged in the number, let's just use the number five to just give it an example real quick. If I plug in the number five to the numerator, what do I get? Negative two. And if I plug in the number five to the, to the part in purple on the denominator, what do I get? Two. two. I get the same numerical value, just opposite signs. Agreed? So these are actually what they're called additive inverses. I get the exact opposite um, when I'm thinking about, like, the sign on the number. So these will cancel. They will reduce. But when they reduce, exactly like what you said, they'll reduce with a factor of negative 1 showing up because they're opposite each other by exactly a, a coefficient of negative 1. That's what ends up showing up. So when I simplify this, because I haven't plugged in x yet, I'm still going to rewrite limit as x approaches 3. I have a negative 1. Put it in the numerator, put it in the denominator. I don't care where you put it, but you're going to get a negative 1 somewhere, and you still have the x plus 3. Can I evaluate it now? 
can, and I won't get any more zeros, will I? I now have the ability, in fact, to replace the x with the 3. And I get negative 1 sixth. Does anybody remember from an algebra class when you have the ability to do this sort of canceling of things out, what happens on a graph, what the graphical interpretation is. Does anybody remember that? It creates a hole. That's what it does. So there was an example of a graph on your paper, and it wasn't a hole like this because there was also a jump in your graph. But this is the kind of graph that creates a hole where everything around it looks beautiful. In fact, if you looked in your graph, you wouldn't even be able to, like your calculator, you wouldn't be able to see the hole, right? It's like a pinprick. It's at that very one spot, and everything else is good to go, and it looks like everywhere else, it's a nice, smooth, pretty function. It's got an asymptote, because I do still have a denominator involved, but nearby the value of x equals three, it looks like it should be good. Everything looks like it's okay, but it actually isn't. There's a hole in the graph. Okay, and we'll talk more about those holes and graphs and issues later. All right, try the same thing on number four. Right? We always, okay, don't, don't be led astray and see polynomials, I have to factor. Don't factor unless you have to, okay? Check to make sure it's necessary first. And the way we check to make sure it's necessary is that we attempt to evaluate it. So we're going to attempt to evaluate this function, x squared minus 5x plus 4 over x squared minus 2x minus 8 for the value of 4. So I have 4 squared minus 5 times 4 plus 4 over 4 squared minus 2 times 4 minus 8. So when I attempt to do that, um, I really shouldn't write that equal sign I just did. Let me fix that. Get that other. This isn't equal. I'm just evaluating to try and see if I'm able to make it that way. What do I get? Zero over zero. Yeah, there's another zero over zero. <laughs> so again, when you get zero over zero, it tells you it absolutely is going to be able to be factored and reduced, actually, not just factored, but factored and reduced. So now we're going to go back and we're going to attempt to do just that, factor and reduce. Okay, so I still haven't actually evaluated the limit yet, so I'm going to rewrite that notation. It's kind of like in a problem as you're working all the way along, if there's a square root, you don't just stop writing the square root until you intend to actually do something with it. Every single step you write it until you actually take the square root. Same thing with limits, all right? You're going to write it on every single step until you actually evaluate it for that value. So we need a factor. So take a sec. See what you get when you factor this. How does the numerator factor? Okay, does everyone agree? That looks good. Awesome. And the denominator? Do we agree? Yeah, looks great. Very good. All right, so does anything factor out? Cancel, reduce, whatever word you want to use. Absolutely. In fact, prettier than the last one, right? Because they actually match. You don't have to worry about any factors of negative one. These perfectly match. They do. So what I'm left with at this point, and you don't necessarily have to write this part out. I'm going to just to make sure we are all understanding. What you're really left with is the function x minus 1 over x plus 2 after it reduced. And now we attempt again to evaluate. Can I do 4 minus 1 over 4 plus 2? You can. What do I get? One. Yeah, I get 3 over 6, which reduces to 1 half. Always going to reduce fractions. Thank you for doing that for me. Okay, so it started out really nice, right? Yay, this is way easier than graphical and numerical. But now there's this sort of extra, you know, mess thrown in. 
but it's using algebra skills that you know. And to be honest, um, the factoring is not going to be like the horrendous, awful factoring that you might have remembered from some of the algebra stuff you did. It's always going to be things that are nice and clean and simple. So that's also sort of friendly as well. Okay, I have one more. This one's a little different. <laughs> um, we're going to attempt the same thing I just did before. Um, but the reality is that it's not going to work just like it didn't on the last two. But there's a trick on how to make it able to be fixed that we didn't have to worry about before because of those radicals. So if I attempt, again, to evaluate this at 0, 2 plus 0 underneath the square root minus the square root of 2 over 0. Obviously, my denominator is 0. Is my numerator also? It is. Okay, so I don't have the ability to just factor this like the polynomial ones in the previous two problems, right? Because it's not a polynomial, it's a radical. So there is a trick on how we deal with this, but it's a trick you've seen used before, and in fact, you probably mostly saw it done in trig, and it's called rationalizing. Do you remember that phrase? And when you did it in trig, most of the time you were rationalizing denominators. Agreed? Rationalize the denominator, no radicals in the denominator, all this kind of jazz. Well, I don't have any radicals in this denominator, do I? You don't. So when we rationalize for these, we're actually going to end up rationalizing the numerator. Okay? So let me rewrite this step. Limit x approaches 0. I have the square root of 2 plus x minus the square root of 2 over x. All right, so to rationalize, when I have um, the radical pieces like I do right here, right, two different radical pieces, does anybody remember what you use to be able to get rid of those radical pieces? Because it's not just one radical, right? It's, it's, a, it's a sum or difference of radicals. Okay, so, yeah, so there's going to be the similar thing that's there. Do you remember what that's called? Do you remember what it's called? Conjugate. conjugate. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Karen. So it's called a conjugate, and it's exactly what... I'm sorry, I don't know all your names yet. What's your name? Hayden. Hayden? Yes. Okay, so it's what Hayden's describing. So we use the same radicals that are already there, 2 plus x um, and 2, and the conjugate is the same thing with the opposite sign between it. So since ours has a subtraction sign between it, our conjugate will have an addition sign between it. And we do the same thing to the numerator as we do to the denominator, of course. So, since I should have said it backwards, but same thing to the denominator as we do to the numerator. So whatever we did on top, we're going to multiply on bottom as well. Now, obviously, I just made the denominator more messy. Um, and, you know, it's okay sometimes you have to make a bigger mess to clean things up. Do you ever clean your closet and you have to drag it all out before you can reorganize it and put it all back in in a better way? It's kind of like that. So the denominator, for the moment, is just going to be messy. It's going to stay as ugly as it looks right now. There's going to be an x, and I'm going to have the square root of 2 plus x plus the square root of 2, and I'm not distributing that x through. It will not help you. Leave it factored for the moment. So why are conjugates helpful? Well, do you remember the problem? I'll come back to the screen, I promise, but yeah, there it was right here, and we talked about the fact that it factors x plus 3x minus 3, and we identified that has a special um, factoring called difference of squares, right? We did that. That's why we're multiplying by the conjugate, is because we've created a difference of squares. Now, the things that are being squared are square roots, and that feels a little bit funny, but what's what we did? Because if you take a look and you try multiplying these out, these first two terms... When I multiply the square root of 2 plus x times the square root of 2 plus x, what do I get? 2 plus x. Radical goes away. Yay. And when I multiply the last two terms, the square root of 2 and the square root of 2, I get 2. And one of them is positive, one of them is negative, so it's actually a negative 2. And then I'll use a different color. The inner term and the outer term cancel out. That's what differences of squares do. The inner term and the outer term cancel out. They end up being exactly the same thing in opposite signs, so they add to zero. So the point in using conjugates is being able to multiply the first two terms 
the last two terms and have no inner and outer terms at all. And when we do that, the radicals vanish. I mean, they don't vanish, but they kind of look like they do. So I end up with the numerator on this one having a 2 and a negative 2 adding to 0. Agreed? So I'm going to write one more step just to make it, oops, that shouldn't say x here. It was supposed to say 0. I'm sorry. Notice in the numerator, I still have an x, but in the denominator, I also have that x that I told you. Don't multiply it through. And now aren't you glad you didn't? Because what's going to happen? They're going to cancel, right? This x and this x are both factors, right? It's in factored form in the denominator, so I'm able to reduce it like that. If it were distributed through, it's a lot harder to see the reducing that you're able to do. And then notice I then have a 1 on top, and I have square root of 2 plus x plus the square root of 2 on bottom. I was kind of tempting to look at it and go, okay, well, the problem started out with square roots on top, and the problem is now at the end of what you've just done with the square roots on bottom. Why did it help? Well, the reason it helped is because the square roots on bottom are added. It was the square roots being subtracted on top that gave me the zero. The square roots being added on bottom, they're not going to give me a zero anymore. That's why it's okay that there's still radicals involved. So I'm actually able to evaluate now. I have my 1. I have my square root of 2. I'll, I'll write it in. Plus 0 plus the square root of 2. So this is actually 2 square roots of 2 on bottom. So you know better from trig than to leave it like that, don't you? You do. So what are you going to do? Yeah. You're gonna, now you're going to rationalize the denominator by multiplying numerator and denominator by the square root of 2. So you're ending up getting a square root of 2 on top and a 4 on bottom. And please don't tell me you're going to try and cancel the 2 and the 4. That doesn't work. The 2 is under a radical. The 4 is not. So you can't actually reduce them. You end up getting square root of 2 over 4. Now, interestingly enough, um, if we tried to do the same problem and you tried to use a table um, or you tried to use a graph, you would never get an answer of square root of 2 over 4, right? You wouldn't, because your calculator doesn't take decimals and turn them back into the radical form. So the best your calculator could do with a numerical table or with a graph is to give you an, a close approximation with a decimal. Whereas here, we get the actual um, exact answer because we have radicals involved on this particular one. All right. You ready to look at a little bit of trig? Yeah? Okay. Trig is much like the polynomials and the rational functions and all those uh, limit properties at the beginning that we had. It does everything you want it to do as long as you're within the domain of the function. Now, sine and cosine are continuous smooth wave patterns, if you remember that. So their domain's all real numbers. Everything else, tangent, cotangent, secant, and co cosecant, all have asymptotes. So they do have things that x can't equal right? Places where there are asymptotes. But as long as you're not at an asymptote location, it has all the same values that will work. You simply evaluate it just like you evaluated the polynomials or the radicals or the rationals. So the limit as x approaches c of sine of x is sine of c. Cosine of x, cosine of c. Tangent of x, tangent of c. And it works out the way that you would hope that it would. I'll pause for a second to give you a chance to write them down. Also a reminder, if, uh, especially if you weren't here last Tuesday, all the notes are in Canvas if you'd like to print them out. Um, today's is not so bad in terms of writing as I'm talking, but some of the days there's a lot of writing and you're not going to be able to get it all done. Um, if you're not printing them out, just so you know. Okay, there are also two special trig limits. Okay, so these are 
sort of like, oh, isn't that cool that we have this extra one? But there's nothing necessarily intuitive about them. On the first one, it tells you what happens when you combine sine of x and x. Um, and there's nothing algebraic or um, you know, simplifying, anything like that, that we can do to get to this point. Uh, your book does show a proof for it. You're welcome to take a look at that. I don't want to spend the class time to prove it for you. Um, you can also take a look at a, a graph or a numerical um, table to verify that it seems reasonable. But the reality is that the sine of x over x, and if you tried to plug in 0, sine of 0 is 0. And if you plug in x is 0 in the denominator, you get 0. You get 0 over 0, kind of like the rational ones we were doing before, right? Well, 0 over 0 can equal anything. It just depends on what happened before. You know, where did those zeros come from? So this limit's actually 1. And a very similar one is the 1 minus cosine of x over x. And as x approaches 0, this one's equal to 0. Not equal to 1, but equal to 0. So what I'd like to show you next is how those play out, um, all the trig properties that we just looked at with a few examples. Does everybody have those written down? We're good? Okay. So we're going to try and find the limit of the trig function if it exists. Again, if you ever have the point where you're trying to plug a number in and you get a number over a zero, right, a non-zero number over zero, it just means does not exist and you're done. D and E move on. Okay, so it's totally a valid possibility. So when it says if it exists, that's what it's referencing. It, it really could not exist and that would be okay. But if you get zero over zero, that's when you have to pause and figure out why that's happening. All right, so taking a look at the first one, number six, just like with all of the algebra ones before, we attempt to plug values in and see if it works. So we're going to try that here. Sine of pi times 2 over 2. All right, so what would we do next? Cancel your 2s. And if I do that, I'm left with sine of pi do you remember what the sine of pi is? Somebody said it. It's zero, yeah. Okay, so um, obviously this one, your calculator can spit back out an answer for you very quickly. Um, one word of advice, just in case you've been um, playing around with your calculator's degree radian mode, everything we do in calculus is in radians, so make sure you're working in radians. Um, but some functions, values, like when we get them, they're not especially pretty. And your calculator doesn't give you very nice values. So if that were the case, you'd have to be a little bit more careful than just using what the calculator says. Number seven is an example of that. So if we try to do the same thing on seven, and I do cosine of five pi over six, your calculator will give you an ugly decimal, doesn't it? It does. Um, and while decimal approximations are often sufficient, um, when we're working with special trig values, I expect that you will be able to go back and catch those um, from what you learned in trig. So if it's been a while, or if you just um, don't have them in your mind right now, which is totally fine, I would suggest that you go print a unit circle out from the internet. Just Google unit circle images, it will find one for you, it'll have the unit circle printed out, Keep it in your notes. Make sure you get to the point where you can remember those pieces on a test, that kind of stuff, um, because the unit circle values come up frequently on trig functions. Does anybody remember from their unit circle what the cosine of 5 pi over 6 is? Do you remember what quadrant you're in? 2. We're in quadrant 2. That's good. Is cosine positive or negative in quadrant 2? It's negative, so it's a good first step. It's negative. It's square root two, square root, close. Three over, three over two. Yes, sorry, I just misheard. Square root of three over two. Yeah, it's negative square root three over two. Okay, so both of those are sort of examples of the trig rules that we just would assume that are beautiful and work all the time and wonderful because I can just plug numbers in and I'm good.
Um, the next two are examples that use those special trig um, functions that I mentioned, or trig limits. Okay, so what you see is you see combinations um, of things. So on number eight, you see a combination of a trig function in the numerator and a polynomial in the denominator. And on number, on number nine, you see not only the same thing with the trig in the numerator and the polynomial in the denominator, but the trig in the numerator actually has two pieces of trig in the numerator, right? So there's going to be some manipulation on these. That's what that means. It doesn't follow any of those simple ones over here that it was just sine or cosine or tangent. It doesn't have that. It's got more involved. So as we're taking a look at this first one, you might recognize that this has a sine of x in the numerator and it has an x in the denominator. Hence, it looks an awful lot like this number one here, doesn't it? Now, it's important to recognize that this only makes sense when x approaches zero. That's valuable, and, and it does on our problem, right? x is approaching zero. So it does sort of fit in the ballpark as that particular property being at play. But there's an extra five in the, numer or the denominator that has to be dealt with, agreed? Okay, so way back at the beginning of the class today, one of the properties we had talked about scalar multiples. Do you remember it? Let me flip back real quick so that you can see where it was. That was it, problem number one right there, property number one. It said if I have a scalar multiple, I can just pull it out in front of the limit and kind of avoid it until the end. That's what it really says, not in those words. It's very not mathematical, but you know, that's what it says. So we can do that in this problem as well. We can take that five that's in the denominator, so it's really a one-fifth, right? Five in the denominator is a one-fifth. You guys good with that? So I can rewrite this with a one-fifth in front. And now I have that sine x over x that looks like that special trig limit. Does that make sense? So we see that one-fifth pulled out. That's a property of limits. We see this piece right here, which we know from our special trig limits is actually one. So our answer ends up being one-fifth times one or one-fifth. And just for the record, before anybody has a chance to sort of ask, I do expect to see the step that shows the one-fifth pulled out in front because that special trig limit doesn't even have any value or meaning if it looks any different. The one-fifth has to be pulled out before you can apply that property. Now, nine's a little different. Um, maybe I should make mention of this, though, first real quick. Um, the reason that I have to do this manipulation, just like the reason we had to do manipulation over here and over here, is because if I try to plug in zeros, I get zero over zero, okay? That's why we're doing it. So if I had something that looked like this, but I got zero over five, I don't have to do any manipulations. I don't have to do any of that. I just move on with it and I give my answer with the numbers that it plugs in and gives me. I mean, that's fine. But if I try to plug this in, I get sine of zero over five times zero, which is zero over zero, and that's a problem, okay? Same thing down here, cosine of zero, tangent of zero over zero, I end up with zero over zero, that's a problem. Okay, so if I attempt to do something where I just evaluate, I'm gonna have problems. So instead, what do you think you might want to do on this problem? Yeah, so in trig, you learn a lot of identities. You guys remember doing identities, right? There's no way you could not remember that. There's no way. I mean, the majority of the class feels like it's about identities. Um, you do not need to know all of the identities you learned in trig. However, I would encourage you to print out from our Canvas classroom the trig identities that I do expect you to know. In particular, there's three types. I expect you to know the quotient identities. That's this one. Tangent is sine over cos cosine. That's a quotient identity. The reciprocal identities. Sine is one over cosecant. That's a reciprocal identity. And the Pythagorean identities. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. And there's a couple others. Okay, those are the three types of identities that you absolutely need to be able to use in calculus. Everything else is sort of just fluff. It can be achieved in different ways. We're not going to worry about them. So print those out so that you know what my expectations are for what you'll be able to use, okay? 
So just like you said, this actually is cosine of x times sine x over cosine of x all over x. That's a quotient identity. And then what can you do? Yeah, you can cancel out those cosines, right? Indeed. And what that then leaves you with is the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x, which is 1. Any questions on those? Okay. Web we'll assigned homework for 1.3. That's due on Thursday. And then we on Thursday we'll be moving on to section 1.4. So have a great couple of days. Stay safe.